in understanding the factors that lead to different levels of well-being in different individuals or among different social groups, we have been learning how social and cultural factors can influence both one's cognitive understanding of the self as well as the decisions and behaviors one adopts in responding to that understanding. We have learned in a number of contexts that education is perhaps the most important driver of future well-being. Greater educational attainment leads both to better health status and to better socioeconomic status, with subsequent socioeconomic status and health highly correlated. We have been looking for a missing fourth factor or factors that lead both to different levels of education and to correspondingly different levels of socioeconomic and health status. From the research by Michelle with the four-year-olds, we saw that children in his experiment who waited for the two marshmallows, when they became adolescents, were more academically successful and more verbally fluent, more rational, attentive, and able to plan ahead, and more able to deal with frustration and stress. These results introduced us to the general concept of time preference. Psychologists have delved more deeply into the issue of time perspective and time preference. Zimbardo and Boyd were able to assess a person's time perspective based on their answers to a series of questions. They were able to characterize different types of time perspective using a series of subscales. They referred to one of these subscales as having a future perspective. Those with this perspective were more likely to respond to questions in the way illustrated on the slide. In contrast to the future perspective, Zimbardo and Boyd described others have, as having what they referred to as a present fatalistic perspective. These individuals were more likely to ascribe their life experiences to fate than to their own actions. Since whatever happened to them was, from their perspective, beyond their control, these individuals tended to avoid planning for the future. A third subscale described those individuals who adopted a present hedonistic perspective, as the researchers described it. These individuals not only avoided planning for the future, but also actively sought out excitement in their daily life, often being willing to take risks. Zimbardo and Boyd studied several hundred college students in California and were able to determine a series of significant correlations between their scales of time perspective and an individual's personal characteristics and academic performance. In illustrating these correlations, I use a solid line to represent a direct correlation where an increase in one factor is associated with an increase in the other, and I use a dashed line to represent an inverse correlation in with an increase in one factor being associated with a decrease in the other. Students who demonstrated a future perspective on time had higher grades in college and spent more hours per week studying. They were also less likely to exhibit aggressive tendencies or to lack impulse control. By contrast, those students who, who demonstrated a present fatalistic perspective showed more aggression and more impulsive behavior with correspondingly lower grades and less time spent in studying. These results are strikingly similar to the results of the Michelle study when they followed their subjects into high school. Might it be that at the age of four, children have already adopted their own perspective on time and that this time perspective stays with them as they enter and subsequently move through school? In 2009, Guthrie and colleagues used the Zimbardo scales of time perspective in a study of more than 500 adults recruited from hair salons and barbershops in a suburb of Washington, D.C. They found that those who exhibited as adults a future perspective tended to be more highly educated and as a consequence to be in a professional occupation. By contrast, those with a present, present fatalistic perspective had the reverse tending to be less educated and less likely to be in a professional occupation. 
time perspective, whether measured as a child, as a college student, or as an adult, seems to be an important predictor of educational and occupational attainment. From the studies we saw earlier in this presentation, we know also that these outcomes are strongly associated with well-being and one's health status as an adult. In addition to time preferences described by Zimbardo, psychologists have identified another important factor affecting educational attainment referred to as self-efficacy. Self-efficacy measures the extent to which an individual perceives himself or herself to have a sense of personal autonomy and control over the outcomes of one's efforts. Writing in 1977, psychologist Albert Bandura described his concept of self-efficacy. His initial theory has grown into what is often now referred to as social learning theory. Under this theory, people's psychological experiences over time lead them to develop a set of expectations about their own capacity to carry out difficult or challenging tasks. If, over time, one learns a strong sense of self-efficacy, he or she will then be willing to take on difficult tasks based on the perception that he or she has the innate ability to succeed in the task. By contrast, those who have learned that their efforts often lead to failure will have a low sense of self-efficacy and are more likely to give up early in the process of confronting a difficult task. Bandura described four sources from which individuals take cues as to whether they will or won't be able to succeed in a task. The first is through past experience, in which those who have repeatedly experienced success in past efforts will learn a higher sense of self-efficacy. By contrast, those who have, have had repeated experience with failure will learn low self-efficacy. The second source is called vicarious experiences. By watching others that we perceive as comparable to ourselves succeed in a given task, we then expect to be able also to succeed in our own efforts in a similar task. Bandura refers to the third source as verbal persuasion. Hearing someone we respect tell us we are capable of doing a task will make us more likely to believe that we can actually do it. Finally, emotional arousal can affect perceived self-efficacy with those experiencing higher stress levels when confronted with a difficult task more likely to perceive low levels of self-efficacy and vice versa. Self-efficacy is an important psychological trait because once one has learned a certain level of self-efficacy, one's perception not one's perceptions tend not to change over time when confronted by new tasks. In addition, people will respond differently to difficulties or initial failures experienced in the process of taking on a task, with those with lower levels likely to attribute their difficulty to their own inadequacy rather than to the innate difficulty of the task or other external factors. A low sense of self-efficacy coupled with a pattern of repeated failures over time, can lead to what has been called learned helplessness. Why even try something if you already know you're going to fail? In a later paper, Bandura tied self-efficacy to the educational attainment of children. As he describes in that paper, students' beliefs in their efficacy to regulate their own learning and to master academic activities determine their aspirations, level of motivation, and academic, academic accomplishment. Based on, this, on these associations, students who approach academic tasks with a high level of self-efficacy will visualize themselves succeeding at the task, while those with low self-efficacy will often see failure as the likely outcome. Bandura cites a study that measured the association between children's initial self-efficacy and their performance on a difficult mathematics task. As expected, 
those with higher self-efficacy perform, perform better on the assignment. However, the positive impact of self-efficacy helped in more than one way. In addition to performing better, these students also tried harder, showing increased persistence in working through a difficult problem. This increased persistence added even more to their performance. It was a combination of the student's belief in her or his capacity to complete the problem combined with a willingness to persist in searching for a solution that contributed to the higher level of success. Bandura cites an, addi an additional relationship that is concerning for those interested in finding ways to help children, especially those children from disadvantaged backgrounds, to improve their sense of self-efficacy. He cited data indicating that when a teacher has a low perception of a student's academic or personal efficacy, that student is likely to internalize that lower expectation in viewing their own self-efficacy. A further difficulty comes from the observation that in schools serving a predominantly low SES community, having had past experiences with lower socioeconomic students often increases a teacher's perception that her or his students enter the classroom with initial low levels of self-efficacy. In addition to time perspective and self-efficacy as factors that affect students' educational attainment, there is an important third factor I'd like to discuss. This is referred to as social anomie. Social anomie reflects the extent to which an individual perceives that the rules that appear to govern, to govern broader society and that offer certain types of rewards in, re in return for certain behaviors those rules don't actually apply to them. For example, an individual who experiences social anomie may understand that society promises that those who invest in their own education will be rewarded with a better standard of living, but that because of who I am, these, these rules don't apply to me. Those experiencing social anomie experience life in the broader social system as unfair favoring some individuals or groups over others. An individual may perceive that she or he is in the out group to which the rules of society don't apply equally. Not surprisingly, those who experience social enemy may end up feeling little hope for attaining a better life. Those who experience racial discrimination, especially as a child or young adult, may easily adopt a perspective of social anomie. By coming to perceive that life is inherently unequal and that society has placed limits on the options that are available to certain groups, one might easily ask the question, why should I even try? Putting these psychological factors together, it becomes easy to see why some individuals, often those from disadvantaged racial or ethnic groups may simply be unwilling to try to make life better by investing in education. If one thinks, I need to try for all I can get right now, I won't even think about the future, also lacking a sense of self-efficacy and perceiving that somehow the broader society will prevent me from getting what I deserve, even if I do try, it is understandable that this individual will be hesitant to invest in his or her own education. Failure to invest in one's education will in all likelihood bring with it lower lifetime socioeconomic status as well as worth, worse health status and other forms of well-being. This process may already be well underway by the time a child is getting ready to enter school. Those children born into and growing up in markedly disadvantaged circumstances may already be at a psychological disadvantage when first presented with the opportunity to invest in their own education. Should I wait for the two marshmallows, or should I take one marshmallow now before it goes away? <laughs>